Welcome to the Expert Exchange, the podcast where knowledge meets success with your host, Joshua Carnes, and expert guest, the biz doctor, Lauren Goldstein. Today's show is brought to you by Lion Business Advisors and Biz Flip Exit. The content in this show is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal tax investment, financial, or other advice. The Expert Exchange is not a fiduciary by virtue of any person's use of or access to this content. The Expert Exchange is not licensed to practice law or provide legal advice. Nothing contained within this show is intended to be an offer to either buy or sell securities. Welcome to the Expert Exchange, the podcast where knowledge makes success. I'm your host, Josh Carnes, and on today's show, we are going to be diving in from operator owner, how to get out from under your business. Uh, joining me on today's show is Lauren Goldstein, the biz doctor and founder and CEO of Golden Key Partnerships. content on this show is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. Nothing in this show constitutes professional or financial advice, nor does any information on the show constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the law relating thereto. The expert exchange is not a fiduciary by virtue of any person's use of or access to this content. You alone assume the sole responsibility of evaluating the merits and risks associated with the use of any information or content on the show before making any decisions based on such information. In exchange for using the content, you agree not to hold the expert exchange its affiliates or any third-party service provider liable for any possible claim for damages arising from any decision you make based on information or other content made available to you through the show. The expert exchange is not licensed to practice law or provide legal advice. Nothing contained within this show is intended to be an offer to either buy or sell securities. So get ready to expand your horizons and refine your strategies as we dive in to from operator owner getting out from under your business with our expert guest, Lauren Goldstein. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's such Glad a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, why don't we start? Tell us a little bit about yourself, why they call you the biz doctor, all the fun stuff, and give us an introduction. All the fun stuff. How much time do I have? No, I'm kidding. All the time in the world. <laughs> so uh, my clients nicknamed me the biz doctor many years ago because what I specialize in is helping you diagnose and cure what you hate about your business. So looking at your people, your your processes, your profitability, to really find out where you're getting stuck in the weeds, where you're staying buried, so that we can unbury you, so you can have a business that's actually a business and an asset instead of a job that you can write off and can't take a vacation from, so you can have that true entrepreneurial freedom. Perfect. So uh, I have heard that you have a degree in cognitive neuroscience. Is that correct? I do, yes. Yeah, so that makes it you the perfect biz doctor, right? How, how does that play in? Yeah, so cognitive neuroscience is a mix of psychology, biology, and chemistry. And really why I love it so much is because, as we know, business owners are a little bit crazy, right? Like, we have to be to be on this roller coaster. But there's something really special about how our brains work, how we see solutions, where most people see problems. But it also gets in our way. It self-sabotages. It stops us from getting out of the weeds. It stops us from really building businesses that can be legacy sometimes if we don't know what's what's hiding in that, you know, three pounds of spicy meatloaf. <laughs> Um, so I've had the pleasure of meeting with you prior to this. Uh, we've networked through Provisors and other things. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've heard your journey uh, previously and kind of how you got to the Biz Doctor. And it's it's kind of unique, right? So why don't you tell us about that journey? Okay. Well, uh, my background is actually in the medical field. I spent many years in the medical field, most notably in pediatric neurology and epilepsy research. I was going to be a doctor as well before I realized that insurance companies dictate patient care, not doctors. And so when we had a little baby come in that we treated and then the insurance company came back and said, actually, we're not going to pay for that continued treatment. I had this existential crisis of what the heck am I doing with my life? I really don't want to be in a field where I can't do what's best for my patients because someone's reading a spreadsheet and looking at cost benefit analysis. And to me, that's just not right because you can't put a cost benefit on someone's life. So I left. I felt like a cork in an ocean. I don't know if that resonates with anyone, but I was a super type A personality, a recovering mm -hmm. perfectionist, and my whole life planned out, be a pediatrician, matching Labradors and Land Rovers and white pick fences and all of that. And then suddenly here I was. Who the heck am I? Because I didn't know who I was outside of the medical field, outside of the work that I was doing with mm -hmm. tiny humans. 
And I remember crying into my grits one morning to my mentor going, am I ever going to figure this out? Like I, I didn't use college to explore all the different things. I just mm. did what I did and studied what I studied. And he goes, okay, Lauren, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think you should be a business consultant. And I lived in Colorado at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, Jean, did you do drugs this morning? <laughs> like, are you high? What What is going on? I specialize in tiny humans. I know nothing about business. And he said, listen to me. Anybody can learn business. I can teach you business. It is something that is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. He said, but what you have in your DNA, your ability to look at things that seem unrelated and make connections and dive down and find the root cause from various symptoms and solve really complex problems is not a skill that most people have. No. And he said, more importantly, it's a skill that business owners need, that unbiased third party that's coming in, helping them sort through all the things that are making noise and distracting them from the real problems that are keeping them stuck in their business. So I said, well, I still think you did drugs and I still think you're crazy, but I have nothing to lose. <laughs> and so I did it and I failed forward for, gosh, probably the first five years. Mm -hmm. um, and then year six, when I had really nailed our diagnostic process, one of my clients, he said, after we, we were doing the R&R, &R, the results and recommendations, he goes, wow, it's so much worse than I thought. <laughs> I, I laughed and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, it's all fixable. Yeah. And he said, I don't know. It was kind of like you took my business and you stuck it through an MRI machine and you were like, there's the cancer. And he goes, you're kind of the biz doctor and it stuck. It stuck. Yeah. That's a great one. And then I have heard you've kind of always had an entrepreneurial spirit though, correct? That is true. Uh, first business at about seven. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Yes, that's true. So. <laughs> what was that? Uh, so I grew up in Colorado and my father, my family business was a custom tax shop. So we made leather goods for horses. So I grew up riding. I grew up at horse shows. Mm -hmm. And so I was surrounded by entrepreneurs. My grandfather also uh, <laughs> repossessed cars, I guess, kind of like the show Repo Man. Um, and I remember wandering around the horse show when I was seven mm -hmm. with my friend Maggie and um I noticed that because we braid our horses to go into classes. Mm -hmm. And so I noticed a supply and demand of of people hated to unbraid their horses because we hire braiders to braid them and then you have to unbraid them. And so I went around with Maggie. I called us the seam rippers because we use a seam ripper to take the braids yeah, out. <laughs> and we would go around and get, I don't know, five bucks for a mane, four bucks for a tail. And, you know, we just had this thriving enterprise during nice. the summers to unbraid horses. <laughs> well done. Let's kind of dive into today's topic, right, of uh, being an operator to an owner, right? Everyone starts out as an operator. That's how you start the business. So what, um, what are some of the most common things that you see owners doing that get themselves stuck in that operator role? Mm, I would say the first is enabling their team. Mm. <laughs> so... A lot of times, and actually I was I was discussing this yesterday with a client, there's a really big connection between someone's sense of self and ego with mm -hmm. problem solving. And so what they subconsciously do is they train their team to come to them for solutions, for permission, for any number of things. And then they get frustrated when their team can't problem solve on their own. But what they've done is they've created this repetition loop where they're not empowering their team to actually go and creatively problem solve or fall on their face and fail and mm -hmm. try and work things out. So that would be the first thing that I would say is they're they're just not able to master the art of letting go without feeling like they're losing control. Yeah, we run into so many businesses when we're helping them exit where the owner is still just so plugged into the day to day. And it's one of those things that's the hardest thing for an owner to do is to let go. And and we we tell these owners, you know, the best businesses that sell are ones where the owner's easily replaceable. And that's mm -hmm. just a weird feeling for some people. Yeah. So. Well, it's kind of a Pandora's box because mm -hmm. one of the services that I do with my clients called the Guild is where we look at the three parts that really keep you stuck, which is understand this the CEO mindset, becoming an effective leader. 
and then the identity piece. And when Mm -hmm. you tell an owner that they're superfluous or not needed, then it creates this cascade of who am I? What is my value? What is my purpose? How do I fit in? And a lot of that then makes them Mm -hmm. self-sabotage. I'll never forget, I had a client that we successfully extricated and then in a really amazing temper tantrum, shall we say. (laughs) He was like, I don't know what's going on with my business. I can't run like that. I used to know everything about ordering and inventory and clients and this and that. And he had people in those departments that were running things very well. But since he had so much white space and time to think about who he was outside the business, it created this storm of identity crisis that just like made him jump back in and become what I call a seagull leader, Mm -hmm. which is essentially where they have an idea du jour or something and they swoop in, (laughs) poop all over the team and then fly away and leave everyone in chaos going what the heck was that? What do we do now? We've, you've kind of hit on a little bit of the clients and who you're working with. What are some of those major challenges that you help clients with? What does it look like to be your client? So when you come in and you're my client, the first thing we do is get very, very clear on where you want to go. Mm Because a lot of business owners start their business because they're an expert and they can solve a problem. And so they've created this wonderful thing that provides for their family, gives them purpose and impact for their clients, but they haven't actually thought about why they have their business. Where is it? Where is it directing them? Do they want to exit? Because as you know, everybody exits. Yep. It's just a matter of if it's on your time or God's time. I'd like to make sure it's on your time. <laughs> so really understanding why you have your business, where you want to go. And then So much of my work is diagnosing first so that you're not chasing the wrong rabbit. So a lot of times I'll hear someone say, oh, we have a revenue problem. And I'm like, well, revenue is a lagging metric. So let's go upstream. What is actually happening that's producing this revenue symptom? And so we really dive deep into, do you have the right people for you? Mm -hmm. Not just the business, but for you to extricate you out of the weeds Then we look at the processes. Do you have the right systems and structures that help your business be predictable and profitable um, and repeatable? And that can back up your team. And then, of course, the last piece is the profitability. Mm -hmm. Where is their bloat? Where Where are the revenue cliffs? Where are the concentrated risks? And so when you come in and you're my client, you get that sigh of relief because you finally have clarity of where you want to go and what problems you're actually solving instead of playing whack-a-mole and firefighter all day. Like really, truly, our work together is about creating a proactive instead of a reactive business Mm -hmm. that can start to grow without you. And even if you aren't in the day-to-day, it still needs you. So figuring out what that secret special sauce is that you put into the business, you can do more of that and less of the things that are draining your time. Nice. So you kind of hit on your diagnosis process and I uh, love how all of your terminology is medical themed as well. <laughs> You've, uh, but um, why is that diagnosis process so important for you and how you work with business owners? Um, I actually did a LinkedIn post about this a few days ago about if you don't diagnose first, Mm -hmm. uh, two things happen. One, you could just be treating the symptoms and not actually the root cause. But two, you can spend a lot of time and energy climbing a ladder that's Mm -hmm. on the wrong wall. So if you don't know what's actually going to make the biggest difference in your business and go and treat that then that's when businesses get in the the cycle of spending and chasing and and just feeling like the the expenses are ballooning mm-hmm. but they're not really having an impact it's generally because you haven't actually nailed what the problem is that's upstream that's creating all the surface level symptoms when you go through that diagnosis process what are some of the most common challenges that you're seeing with business owners today Oh, that could be a whole episode (laughs) in of itself. (laughs) Um, I would say the biggest challenges are um, when it comes to team, not understanding how to hire the right people. That's a big one. Um, How to hire the right people for you, but also the right people for the role. Um, Another challenge is the changing of the guard. Mm -hmm. So um, 
entrepreneurs tend to be very emotional, passionate people, which is great. And sometimes when you have people that got you somewhere that are not equipped to get you to the next level of your business, it's hard to let go of that. But a lot of a lot of the work that I do is saying, okay, is this person really a good fit in this role, in this business, in this next level? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, looking at the challenge of how do you change someone's identity and detach it from, you know, all the doing? Because a lot of times, like like I had a client a few weeks ago when I said, because during one of my diagnostics, Mm -hmm. one of the questions is when you see white space on your calendar. What's your first instinct? Mm-hmm. And he goes, oh, I go and I talk to X and I see what she's doing and I see what what I mm-hmm. what I should be doing. And I said, but none of those things that she's doing are your job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, well, I know, but I need to be doing something. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the big things is we've never really stopped and had the conversation of, okay, once we extricate you from your business and you get that time back and you're not working 80 hour weeks, what are you going to do? Yeah, that's a huge question. Who are you? Like, is your wife going to divorce you because you're just (laughs) like trying to run her? I don't know. Like, we saw that Mm -hmm. with my grandfather. I had this true story Mm -hmm. where we were like, okay, you're keeping your office because you need to go away. Mm -hmm. Like, go, I don't know, go read your emails at the office because you're driving grandma crazy. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of times when, when business owners exit where like the first three months is great, but then they're like, well, now I'm bored. Now I don't know what to do. Now I'm going to go create chaos because that's a really interesting thing with entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs grew up in chaotic childhoods. Hmm. So we thrive in chaos because we know how to manage it, right? We don't know how to thrive in calm because that is not something our nervous system is used to. And so our brain says, prepare. Like, inevitably the shit is going to hit the fan. Sorry, this is not an explicit. <laughs> You're good. So it is now. <laughs> and so a lot of those challenges are, are looking at, do you have the right team for you? Mm-hmm. Are you building the right business for you? Cause sometimes people want a lifestyle business versus a legacy business and that's yeah. okay. And then really understanding what are you going to do when you have a business that can run while you're on vacation? Yeah. Um, so my next question has to do with some stuff that I have heard on your podcast, oh. <laughs> but I realized before we do that, why don't you tell us about your podcast and what some of the things you talk about? Oh, I would love to. So it's called the biz doctor podcast, and it's kind of my love letter to business owners mm-hmm. to really dive into the things that I don't think we talk enough about. So mm-hmm. you, um, have heard me talk about how The mental health of entrepreneurs is something I'm so passionate about. And so I like to talk on the show. I bring in experts to talk about different um, complementary aspects of business. But then I talk about leadership and productivity and mindset, emotional intelligence to just kind of create this holistic approach to being a business owner Mm -hmm. that's not just about your business. It's about who you are as a person. So one of the things, and it's a great podcast, by the way, go check it out. Thank you. Um, And we'll link to it uh, in all the information we provide. So, But one of the things I've always heard you talk about is the keys to success about getting out from under your business. And you've mentioned it a few times. So what are some of those keys to success of getting out from under your business as you see it? Mm. So um, I have the seven C's to a high-performing team and a business, and there's the top three that I would say impact everything across the board. The first is clarity. Like you really can't get where you want to go if you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. So clarity is really where you have to start. You have to have clarity of the business and the vision and you've got to know your numbers Mm -hmm. and you have to have the right team and you have to have clear accountabilities for your team. Like I cannot tell you how many business owners where I say, okay, tell me about this person's role and they make a laundry list of things. And I said, okay, well, how do you know if they're being successful? And they're like, oh. <laughs> and you just, you like all of a sudden see this blank space where they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know. Yeah. Um. So there's that. And then you got to look at capacity and capability. So capacity is is not necessarily having too much on your plate. It's having too much unrelated stuff on your plate. And that's pretty much what an operator is until they're an owner. They're a chief everything officer that's doing all the things. And so 
part of that capacity conversation is what are you actually good at? Mm -hmm. What should you be doing? How can we do more of that and less of this other stuff? Yeah. And breaking through that, you know, itty bitty shitty committee that's in your brain that's saying, well, I can do it better Mm -hmm. or it's going to cost less if I do it. I will never, I will never forget. I was, this is a very Texas story. Mm. I was at a, a networking event at a barbecue restaurant and um, I was talking to a lady who, um, like we had just had a very brief conversation several weeks before and she was lamenting to me about how she was struggling to hire someone because she could do, like, she's the yeah. delivery expert. And I, and an offhanded comment said, you could, but have you ever done the math? And she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, have you ever done the math of of what your, even if you're an owner, your hourly rate, I'm using air quotes yeah. here, <laughs> is, and then calculated that? Because it's one thing if you're doing that one thing once a year. Yeah. But if you're doing that every day, every week, every month. <laughs> so I could see the light bulb. And she came back at the barbecue where I saw her and she said, my God, I did the math and I'm costing my business tens of thousands of dollars. Yep. And so- the capacity conversation comes to like, yes, it might seem like you're saving money, but you could go close a client to bring in that money. Yep. And so really get looking at your whole team and, and saying, where who's best suited for these things? Because you can get so much more done, even part time with somebody whose expertise or like superpower is that thing. Then banging your head against the wall for eight hours trying to do the thing yeah. that you're not good at. And then capability. That really all comes together. Like, is this person capable? And this is something that I am very divergent from other people. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's about technology stacks. I don't think it's about software. I don't think it's about can you use a camera or a microphone? It's about in your DNA. Are you equipped to succeed in this role? Like, I would never put someone who loves closed loops, who is a perfectionist or recovering perfectionist <laughs> in my my case, in a sales role. Like, I just never would do it because salespeople have to be flexible, quick on their feet. It's about relationships. Someone who loves closed loops, who is a recovering perfectionist, is probably going to be a controller or somebody in the back office who's Mm -hmm. like number one priority is making sure that T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Yeah. And so if you look at those three together, I'm not going to get into the other four. That's the bulk of what you have to dial in to even try to extricate yourself. Because if you're not clear, if you're not looking at who's capable of doing what, and you're not looking at how that impacts capacity, then everybody's going to be over-resourced or rather under-resourced. Yeah. And it's just going to (laughs) suck. You started to lead into hiring the right people and doing that. Um, I know that, uh, you know, outside of podcasting, you also happen to be a little bit of a speaker and you've done some things. One of the presentations that you've done is around bullseye hiring, mm-hmm. right? So let's dive into that. What What are some keynotes or some key aspects that we can take from that? Yes. One of my favorite keynotes, actually, uh, bullseye hiring, make your next hire your best hire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... Uh, Why I love this is, again, it goes back to, I think I mentioned this maybe 10 minutes ago, about having a proactive business instead of a reactive business. Mm -hmm. Most business owners wake up and they're like, oh, shit, we need to hire somebody yesterday. So then they, like, throw together a job description that basically says you have to know, like, Slack and Google Docs and Word and Mm -hmm. whatever random tech stack you're using. And then... They hire somebody quickly and then that person's gone within the first 90 days and they're just stuck on this hire fire cycle and they're frustrated Mm -hmm. because they're like this. There has to be a better way. Well, folks, there is a better way because it takes I think the number is on average 100, 100 hours to hire somebody and onboard them. Wow. Just, you know, put that in the back of your mind. So if you are hiring somebody the wrong way, Mm -hmm. that's 100 hours down the toilet because it's your time, your team's time, the new hire's time, all the stuff. So what I talk about in bullseye hiring 
is doing your due diligence upfront. So going back to clarity. So we have a tool that I've designed over the past 13 years of doing this because frankly, I got tired of chasing all the shit around mm -hmm. like this document here and there and everything. So it's called a scorecard. It's golden mm -hmm. key scorecard. And it's a, basically a spreadsheet that has all the information for a role in one place. Mm -hmm. So it's got the mission of the role, why it's important, their accountabilities, threats and interdependencies, core values. It's also got a tab where you can do your monthly review. Mm -hmm. Because the key for hiring effectively is actually sitting down and thinking through what problem are they solving? How are we measuring success? Who are they in their DNA that I know they will be successful? Like mm -hmm. that's one of the whole columns is traits. And we sit down and we say, okay, this person has to have, you know, attention to detail and good communication and various and sundry other things that mm -hmm. then we rate everybody by to make sure we're choosing the right person. And so by having the clarity of like making sure that you know exactly who you're hiring, why you're hiring mm -hmm. him, how they fit in the company, that solves, I would say, 85% of the crash and burn that I see with hiring and then firing. And then the other component of hiring in this way is understanding really how to test people mm -hmm. as they go through. So something that we do, which actually saves a ton of time, um, I actually got this video idea from Cameron Harold and Tim Francis, but um, we put up a very detailed job description. Like if you see my job description, it reads like a story. Hmm. I always get the, I read this and I just had to apply because you described me like to a T, right? Perfect. So it attracts the people yeah. we want to attract. It repels the people we want to repel. And then if they follow the directions, because there's an Easter egg in there, then they get the second step, which is a loom. I ask them for a loom where they submit a five minute or less basically introduction and answer a few questions. And so I'm constantly testing them along the process, the process. exactly, because I want to see how do they handle curveballs? How do they hand handle software that maybe they haven't used before? Are they flexible? Are they not? Do they have attention to detail? Do they not? And so when you want to make your next hire your best hire, you have to have the clarity, but then you also have to go through the process of really understanding who they are. And so Loom is that first, like, next level of demarcation. Mm -hmm. But then the third one, um, and this is where I see a lot of business owners fall on their face, is the interview. Yeah. Where they're like, I don't, literally, I had a client call me one day in a panic, and he was like, I don't know what to ask. And I'm like, how do you not know what to ask? I've given you a sheet. He was like, oh, right. I forgot. Because they're like so used to tell me where you went to college. Yeah. Like where do, like very random things. But the way that I interview, which goes back to my neuroscience background, I'm also a board certified NLP practitioner. Mm. So I ask questions that are going to tell me much deeper things. Like when conflict arises, how are you going to respond? Mm hmm. How are you measuring success? How do you like feedback? How do you like to be acknowledged? How are you going to process all the different things in your day to actually stay on deadline? And so I, there's maybe one question in my entire interview set that is about the job. Like it's basically it says, hey, this is our mission for the job. Tell me what you would do. But then in specifics, like I'll say, like, have you used Slack before? Like, mm -hmm. yes, no questions. But the bulk of it is about who are you as a person and can you be successful in this role? That's what I'm listening for. Some great feedback there for anybody looking to <laughs> get or hire. I'm going to save that one and replay it back myself. There so. you go. Um, you, you and I have talked before and, and earlier you hit on everybody exits, mm -hmm. right? At, at the end of the day, whether it's your timing, someone else's time, or just something happens, everybody exits at some point. So uh, you've talked before a lot about what you do is helping owners prepare to exit, mm -hmm. whether they know they're doing it or not. <laughs> right. So um, how do you deal with those business owners where they're not even contemplating the exit or what that's going to look like for them, but yet they're working with you? Yeah. So again, it comes back to the why. Because mm -hmm. it could be that 
to be honest, they don't want to retire because yeah. they probably shouldn't. <laughs> like most entrepreneurs probably will never truly retire. Yeah. So it's understanding what is what is driving the bus, so to speak, because I don't think anybody wants to think about death or divorce or not being able to work. Mm -hmm. But the more forewarned you are, the more forearmed you are. Yeah. And so it's about having that conversation of, OK, you may never exit. You may never sell this. But wouldn't it be amazing if you went on a vacation with your wife to Paris that you've been saying you want to go on for the past five years mm -hmm. and your business grew? Or wouldn't it be great if you if you never said to me again, why can't they just do their job? <laughs> right. Or like just feeling this sense of relief that you're not playing whack-a-mole and putting out yeah. fires all day. Like, wouldn't it be great if you could say, you know what? I just got invited to a last minute golf game and I'm going to go. Going. <laughs> right. Or um, I was talking to somebody and I can't remember how it happened, but essentially they were like, hey, um, Russell Branson is is going to have like a very intimate dinner on the island in two days. Most entrepreneurs would be like, I'd love to go, but there's no way I can do it. But if you set up your business like you're going to exit, mm -hmm. you could do that. Yeah. And so one of the questions that I ask in my diagnostic, which I love, <laughs> is if you were in the market to buy a business and yours was for sale, Oof. would you buy it? That's funny. We we ask clients that <laughs> sometimes of, hey, yeah. why would you buy your business today? And they're, I wouldn't. You're I like, wouldn't. Oh. Yeah. So why not? That's where <laughs> we're going to start, right? So it's it's like so much of my job is is not about telling them what to do. It's about asking the right questions that then the wheels start turning and then they can see where they're in their own way because – we know that humans, in theory, would love for somebody to tell them what to do, mm -hmm. but they don't want to be told what to do, right? So there's a dance there. Especially those owner operators. Right. That they're so slight, stubborn. <laughs> yeah. Slightly stubborn. Yes. So there's that dance that I get to do where it's kind of like, my clients will probably laugh if, if they listen to this, but it's kind of like if you have toddlers and you want them to eat something and you give them three options, mm -hmm. all great options that you're okay with, mm -hmm. but they feel like they, they have free choice. <laughs> That's kind of what we what we do um, in my business where I'm like, okay, if you want to get to X, here's the three ways we can do that. Which Choose your own adventure. Which one do you want to go down? And sometimes it's very funny because I will say, don't do that. <laughs> and then we're like, no, it's going to be a great idea. Then three months later, they're like, that was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, let me replay this Zoom call <laughs> where I told you not to do that. So, yes. Um, earlier, you hit on your seven C's mm -hmm. and we, we kind of highlighted the top three. What are those other four C's that uh, you have? <laughs> so there's culture, communication, commitment, and connection. Mm -hmm. And I I literally could spend the entire rest of our time talking about them. But those other four are really about understanding that it's not just about is the person doing the job. Mm -hmm. It's about what is your business providing for them? It's a two-way street. How yeah. is your business adding to their vision. Do you know what your client's vision, your client's, your employee's vision is? Do you know why they're working for you? Do you know that they're going through IVF or looking to buy a house or their mother-in-law just got diagnosed with cancer? Like sometimes I think business owners are like, it's just business, but it's not. Our yeah. businesses are run by humans. And the more we can build a culture around the core values that are important to us, that gives us a North Star to make decisions that are a win-win for everyone and make sure we're talking about the same thing. It helps everyone be more committed and play to win. It also makes for better communication because people aren't hiding things because they think you're going to react in a certain way or they're embarrassed because they made a mistake. Um, like I think it was Sarah, um, who was it? Um, I can't remember who it was. It might have been... Um, Who's the owner of Spanx? Sarah Blakely, right? Is that it? I think, I think so. so. I think that's right. 
<laughs> Don't come after me if that's wrong. I do own space. We'll fact check you. We'll fact no, check. Yes, th- please do. <laughs> but she was talking about at her dinner table when she was growing up, her father would ask every day after school, what did you fail at? And I think that's such an important question because so often we're like frozen by this, like, what if I make a mistake? What if I fail? And if you want to get out from under your business, you have to let your employees fail, Mm -hmm. which is terrifying. So you have to figure out what they can fail at without having catastrophic downstream repercussions. But if you can give them opportunities to fail and fail forward and learn, you're going to create from back to bring it full circle to the very beginning, you're going to create a more autonomous more critically thinking, successful, all of the things that you want in a team, high performing, because you're actually enabling them to develop and become leaders. Because that's really the number one job of a leader is to create other leaders. So it's interesting. Uh, we just onboarded a, a new m and advisor last week. And part of our process after like day one of training is I asked them, I go, all right, so your homework is I need one, three, five-year goals professionally and personally. Mm. And I'm like, what? what is it you and your spouse are trying to get out of this business? Because our business is kind of a lifestyle as business. It's, um, you, there's no nine to five, you're always on, but you can set your own schedule. If you want to go play golf, you can do it as long as you've done everything you need right. to do. Yeah. And so it's really interesting when you you see someone, especially someone who's you know, punched a time card forever and worked at a company who could care less about their spouse and their kids and all that. Right. And day one, I'm saying, no, what, you, you know, what's going on? Are we trying to get a kid into an elite college? Like, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. What numbers does that look like? And how can I help you hit mm-hmm. those goals? And um, it's, it's really funny how much some people struggle uh, coming onto a business of like, you want, why, why don't you need that? I can sell. And I'm like, ah, that's, not what yeah that's not the thing we're we're going to we're going to make sure everything is on there so it's a fun question really diving into uh the pers- the people that you bring on and getting to know them yeah i even have a no business meeting every single month that's interesting and it's the there's one rule you cannot talk about the business you cannot talk about your job you cannot talk about your metrics the only thing i want to know is what's going on with you Like, this is how I found out that, like, one of my employees' kids got kicked out of school, Um, which is such – I, like, won't go on that tangent. But, like, come on, special need kid kicking him out of school? Are you kidding? Um, Or, you know, somebody else was expecting or, you know, got engaged. Mm -hmm. Like, any number of things because you give them the space to just be present and have a relationship with you. Because I I don't remember the exact statistic, but I think it's something like – 65% of people who quit jobs quit because of the relationship with their manager. So that's why one of the seven C's is about connection Mm -hmm. and being a human first, (laughs) like caring about your team in such a way that they are are loyal to you because you've built that relationship, not because they're afraid to leave. Yeah. And uh, that's been a huge part of our success. If you look back through, uh, our very first hire is still with the company, right? You, you know, and um, I, you know, he'll probably be, hopefully, he'll be with us forever, right? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, but everyone I think that's successful on our team has, has been with us for several years. And it's, uh, you, you know, it's because we have a small team. And mm-hmm. people connect and engage outside of work. And it's it's crazy what happens when you do that. It's such a little thing, but it's it's a big thing. It is so. a big thing. It's a testament to you. And even if you have a remote workforce, you can still create this. So don't use remote work as an excuse for not having connection. No, absolutely. So our team is all spread out throughout Central Texas and Oklahoma. So it's absolutely doable. Yeah. Um. And a lot of what you do, and I I think you even hit on this earlier, seems like you're very, very passionate about the mental health of entrepreneurs, right? Um, In general, can you you share why that is or why you're passionate about that? Yes, I can. Uh, Well, one, I think business owners and entrepreneurs have created the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Like so many things that we use day to day were the brainchild of a shower thought, right? <laughs> and there is also this dark side to entrepreneurship, 
where you think you're the only person going through it. It's very lonely at the top. Let's not talk about the stresses of highs and lows and making payroll and all of that. And I think when we look at the people who have left us, you know, through suicide, drug addiction, et cetera, it's because we don't talk enough about the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, I say you shouldn't compare your behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel because we see these people having, you know, nine figure exits or 10 figure launches. I mean, that would be a huge launch. (laughs) Let's say it. Let's say an eight figure launch. Yeah. And you're just like, what are they doing that I'm not doing? And then you get in this whole comparison, worthiness, imposter conversation, where in reality, I think so much of what we do as entrepreneurs is so special and so unrelatable to anybody outside of entrepreneurship. And so if we have these conversations, if we support one another and say like, hey, you're having a tough week with a business partner. I've had a similar situation. Let's talk about it. Let's support. Like it gives everyone permission to really step up and into the light, I think in a much different way. Because when we're vulnerable about what's working and what's not, Mm -hmm. then it gives other people permission to also be vulnerable. But it also inspires other people who maybe are sitting on the sidelines, sitting on a great idea, saying, there's no way that I could be Joshua or Lauren. Like, wow, they've got it all together. (laughs) Spoiler alert. (laughs) I do not. (laughs) Don't worry. We're on the same page there. We're still figuring it out. Like, I think that's the moment of adulthood that's probably the most shocking when you realize your parents don't actually have it all figured out and they're human. And then you realize that we may be adults, but I don't know if any adult really truly has it figured out. You're, they're just adults, you're adults. Yeah. And so when I look at mental health, it's, it's, you know, understanding the highs and lows, but it's also about being a dynamic individual. It's not just about your business. That's where I see a lot of people get into trouble is where they've wrapped their whole identity, their whole sense of self and purpose and all of that into their business. And they forget about their hobbies or their family or their spirituality. And it just becomes this echo chamber where you're trying to get everything from one thing. And Mm -hmm. it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on it. And that's when a lot of things tend to go wrong. Yeah. You, you know, it's interesting too. So you talk about, you know, eight and nine figure exits and, and all of that. Um, I'll, we get a phone call all the time and some business starts out with, you, you know, I know I'm probably too small for you to help. Hmm. Um, and it's interesting. The the real stats are over 70% of businesses are under a million dollar business. Yeah. And they're great businesses mm-hmm. that do great products, great yep. service, great at whatever it might be, but you, you know, a business that's doing a million dollars is actually a great business. It's not too small. It you, you know, yeah. um, and the the one thing I love about what you're doing too is you know a lot of these baby boomer exodus and all of this that's hitting. These are great businesses that put a family that made a family. It mm-hmm. put kids through college. It provided everything, and people want those businesses today. And so it is sellable. It's not too small. It's not, um, you you know, your 30 years, 40, 50, 60 years of work uh, wasn't a waste as long as you do it right and you bring in the right team. So really important for for entrepreneurs to know that their business isn't too small. They've got something. Keep working on it. Clean it up and you'll be good. Yeah. Well, also, if you prepare for exit, here's a fun fact, it will be more profitable and spin off more cash. So I would rather have you know, a million, sub-million dollar business that's got 50% profitability than a $10 million business that's at 2%. Um, As we get ready to wrap up here, I know one of the things that you've talked about, and we've hit a lot on mentally happier employees and owners and all of that, but one of your kind of keynote uh, addresses is having mentally happier and healthier uh, and more resilient teams. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you give us a few kind of takeaways or expand on that just a little bit more as we wrap up? Yeah. Another one of my favorite talks. It's like I, all of my talks are my favorite. (laughs) So um, again, that could be a whole podcast episode, but I think one of my favorite takeaways from that talk um, beside I, I alluded to, you know, um, there's the seven pillars mm-hmm. of life, um, but it you got to have that holistic approach. Like you can't just have your employees only working, 
there's hobbies, there's fitness, there's wellness, there's mm -hmm. spirituality. But the thing that I love the most about that talk is um, this study that Marcus Buckingham did mm -hmm. with Disney. So fascinating. So when it comes to successful teams mm -hmm. and the and the teams that are really like just knocking it out of the park, the common denominator was they loved what they did. Now, I know, I can hear you saying, okay, I mostly love what I do, <laughs> but do I love it all the time or do you have to love it? Here's the key. You only have to love 20% of it. That's it. 20%. Oh, Not 100, 20 and he illustrates this, and this is hysterical. This is honestly one of my favorite stories. Mm -hmm. He asked Disney to pull together the top housekeepers at Disney World. And he got them in a room. And he said, I want to know what you love about your job. So the first person, she goes, I love making the marks in the carpet and like <laughs> hopping out at the end. And I mean, the OCD recognizes the OCD yeah, in her. Like, is... I'm just like, yes, yes, girl, I get it. <laughs> and he's like, okay, that's interesting. He asks the next girl or the next lady. She says, I love laying on the bed. And he's like, excuse me? I'm Are pretty you... sure it says right here in the handbook, you're not supposed to lay on the bed. And she goes, no, 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 this is what I do. That's the last thing I do when cleaning the room because that's the first thing they're going to do. So I'm looking at the ceiling and I'm going, is there dust on the fan? I'm laying in the bathtub and saying, is there, you know, like wow. scum around the bathtub? Because I want to look at it from their perspective. And he's like, okay, I think that might be an HR complaint, but we'll move on. The third lady goes, I love making scenes. He's like, what does that mean? And he goes, or she goes, I take, you know, Mickey and Minnie and I set them on the bed and Minnie's got the remote and Mickey's hands in some popcorn. Or, you know, I'm over here with Goofy and Pluto and I'm just, I'm making the kids think that their Disney characters have had a date without them. Nice. And I love this story because it perfectly illustrates how there was really nothing that they described that was actually like the job, job description. description. That's right? It was fun. they had created something that brought them a sense of purpose, of impact, of fun. Like, I think we get to bring fun back to mm -hmm. our teams. Like, if you want to have a mentally happier, healthier, and more resilient team, you get to have fun. Yeah. Then you get to have, you know, purpose and help them be holistic, well-rounded individuals who have an identity outside of whatever their job is. And I think having that love component and really finding what people love about their job. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a bookkeeper who... Like, there's nothing that she loves more is when it says reconciled. <laughs> and I'm like, I get it, right? Yeah. But also, I, I'm not going to do that because, like, yep. that's not that's not something that just super jazzes me up. But that's, that's like, her love language. Mm -hmm. So find what your people's love language is and what your love language is, and you will inevitably create that happier, healthier, and more resilient team. Great stuff, Lauren. Uh, so... Thank you so much for for coming down today and for sharing uh, with business owners. I, I think they're going to get a lot out of this. Yes. If uh, a business owner wants to reach out with you, um, well, how, how do they get a hold of you? Great question. So the ways to connect with me, obviously tune into the Biz Doctor podcast. Yes. When is that? It drops uh, the first and third Wednesday of the month. It's available on all the platforms. I also have a newsletter on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Or, of course, our website is goldenkeypartnership.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram, if that's your thing. I'm not on TikTok or Snapchat or all the – I'm an elder millennial. I don't know how to make those work. But <laughs> you can inevitably get a hold of me one of those ways. Perfect. And we will link – uh, to all of that information, the the podcast, your website, all that good stuff um, at the, the bottom once this airs. And uh, if you've enjoyed what you've heard today and you want to continue the conversation, you can always find us on X at the EXP Exchange or visit our website, theexpertexchange.pro. That's expertexchange.pro. And again, uh, thank you to Lauren, the biz doctor, for coming out. And remember, success is a journey, and we are thrilled to be a part of yours. We'll catch you on the next episode of The Expert Exchange.
content on this show is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. Nothing in this show constitutes professional or financial advice, nor does any information on the show constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the law relating thereto. The expert exchange is not a fiduciary by virtue of any person's use of or access to this content. You alone assume the sole responsibility of evaluating the merits and risks associated with the use of any information or content on the show before making any decisions based on such information. In exchange for using the content, you agree not to hold the expert exchange its affiliates or any third-party service provider liable for any possible claim for damages arising from any decision you make based on information or other content made available to you through the show. The expert exchange is not licensed to practice law or provide legal advice. Nothing contained within this show is intended to be an offer to either buy or sell securities.